Good afternoon, everybody. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the role of CT uh, in assessment of patients with pulmonary hypertension. My objectives are very simple. I'm going to tell you about how CT helps in assessment of patients with pulmonary hypertension. I'm going to share a few case examples and say this is how this is going to work. And I want to convince all of you that after the patient is seen by the clinician, after they have a primary examination, they have a chest radiograph and an echocardiogram, CT pulmonary angiography invariably should be one of the first investigations that are performed in all the patients who come with pulmonary hypertension. I will also put in a quick note about the technique of doing CT so we get very good results. All of this has to be put in context to the specific topic in saying that we have a 28-year-old female in front of us who's got dyspnea on exertion with heart failure, with RV dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension on echo. So how are we progressing in diagnosing this patient, in prognosticating this patient and helping in the management of this patient in there? First, to begin with, let's look at how do we assess for pulmonary hypertension on CT. So we would do a CT contrast examination whereby we do an angiogram of the pulmonary artery. There are a few parameters that we look at which tell us that this patient has pulmonary hypertension. One such parameter is the dilatation of the main pulmonary artery in relationship to the aorta. The main pulmonary artery should be less than 3 cm and should be smaller than the aorta. If either of these things is not there, then we suggest that this could be pulmonary hypertension. The other feature to look for is the dilatation of the right ventricle in comparison to the left ventricle. The right ventricle invariably is smaller than the left ventricle, but if we start to see that the RV is dilated, another feature of pulmonary hypertension. We can also see pseudo marker of tricuspid regurgitation on a CT scan. So when you see contrast within the right ventricle, and you also see contrast refluxing into the IVC and the hepatic veins. That is a surrogate marker to say that the patient has got tricuspid regurgitation, another feature pointing towards pulmonary hypertension. So when we've seen this CT, we've seen that this patient has pulmonary hypertension, then comes to investigate the cause of pulmonary hypertension. And this is the standard classification of the WHO in terms of grouping patients into different categories uh, according to the etiology of pulmonary hypertension. Now let us go one by one and as we go along I will show you what is the role of CT in each of the group and how does it really help. Now, If you look at group 1 pH which is kind of most common uh, condition that we would see the idiopathic pulmonary hypertension gets labeled very easily and very often which I think is very wrong. We have seen a lot of patients who get referred to us as idiopathic pH and when we do imaging we are able to find actually an underlying cause for pulmonary hypertension. In CT, in group 1, the first and important thing becomes congenital heart diseases. When you start looking at patients who may have a simple ASD, who may have a PFO which has been there along with another feature such as in anomalous pulmonary venous connection. These are pathologies which may not be easily picked on echo, MR for that matter or any other modality. So anomalous pulmonary venous connections are very very important. Intracardiac shunt, echo is very good at picking these things but when it comes to extra cardiac shunts, uh, CT is excellent. This is one condition where we have seen a lot of cases where you start to see a shunt between the portal vein and the systemic vein. This is the portal vein draining directly into the IVC causing a portosystemic shunt uh, entity uh, which is very rare but called as Abernathy syndrome which is again a cause of pulmonary hypertension. Another cause where we can see here is portal hypertension as part of liver disease, chronic liver disease with varices that we can see, extensive ascites that could also be the cause of portal hypertension leading to pulmonary hypertension in this particular patient and CT is fantastic at picking these. Now when we look at our index patient 28 year old female 
she could have pulmonary AV malformations. You know, you can see multiple AV malformations which CT will cl show classically. She could have connective tissue disease, which we can see very well as part of group one. We can see that uh, esophagus is dilated. There could be interstitial lung disease. Two other entities which are very rare but can be seen is pulmonary veno-occlusive disease and pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis. Again, a histopathological diagnosis, but CT has classical features that one can see in these patients. Are you seeing these crown glass changes along with septal lines? We should think about pulmonary veno-occlusive disease or pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis in this. So group one uh, causes of pH, CT is fantastic in picking a lot of these. Now if we see group 2 causes of uh, pH, you're primarily looking at left ventricular pathologies or left heart pathology. So a LV dysfunction with mitral valve disease uh, can cause that and CT can show you that. You can see this is a patient who's got mitral stenosis and you can see there is restrictive physiology in there and also you can see another case of restrictive physiology where there is endomyocardial fibrosis where both LV and RV are involved and LA, LA and RA are dilated. Again, this would account for pulmonary hypertension. So CT is again very useful to show us what is happening. Group 3 conditions, then we are looking at patients with lung abnormalities. This is a patient who's got extensive emphysema. Well, this is a patient who's got extensive interstitial lung disease, which would again account for pulmonary hypertension. In children, when you're looking at group 3 conditions where you're looking for developmental abnormalities of the lung, you can see areas of hyperinflated lungs with collapse of other segments, which again can be easily picked up on a CT scan. Group 4 pH, which is something of a special interest to us in Narayana Hridayalaya, uh, where we see chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, where you will see areas of wall calcification, calcified thrombus in there. This is what an acute pulmonary embolism would look like. This is what a chronic pulmonary embolism would look like. We would get webs in the pulmonary arteries and we can do dual energy CT scans to look at areas of hyperperfusion compared to normal areas. This is one uh, such case where you will be able to see webs within the pulmonary artery if you concentrate here. This is webs within the pulmonary artery which is causing pulmonary hypertension. This patient can then undergo catheter angiography where again you can see webs. And this is a uh, rewarding diagnosis because these patients can be operated and they do extremely well if correctly managed in there. So this is a sample from this patient where this is the clot within the pulmonary artery which has been extracted out and we can see all the clots form in the shape of the pulmonary arterial tree. Group 5 where we talk about multifactorial conditions where you may be seeing systemic disorders hematological disorders. This is a patient who had uh, Langerhansel histiocytosis. This is a patient who's got a lymphangiomyomatosis where you can see lung cysts, pneumothorax, all of these contributing to pulmonary hypertension. I'll take one exception here. This is images from MRI imaging where a patient who's got uh, excessive iron deposition in the liver. This is normal liver and this is a liver which has severe iron deposition, which can also account for pulmonary hypertension. CT is not very good for estimation of iron in these patients, but otherwise MR is fantastic in this scenario that we are looking at. So quick word about CT technique. Uh, what we do is uh, we tend to do two runs after contrast is given, we do one scan and then we have two scans so there is good contrast in the uh, pulmonary artery to look for clots. There's good contrast in the aorta to look for shunts. We make sure that we go to the bottom of the kidney. So we are looking for portosystemic shunts. We are looking for liver abnormalities. We are looking for portosystemic uh, abnormal vascular connections in these patients. So it becomes a comprehensive assessment. 
We look at the lungs, make sure there are no primary pulmonary parenchymal abnormalities to account for these uh, patients having pH. Also, uh, we don't like to look at printed films when we are looking at pulmonary angios. You can see this is a patient and this is what a printed film would look like. You would think this pulmonary artery is normal. If we adjust the contrast and you can see that this patient actually has a web and this is a patient with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. The concept of appropriate management diagnosis of this patient's uh, is very well dealt with the Pulmonary Vascular Research Institute. They've come up with a beautiful algorithm in terms of looking at group 4 versus other group of uh, pulmonary hypertensions and what should be our diagnostic workup in these patients. And what you can see here is that CT forms a integral part in the diagnosis, whether it is group 4 CTF patients or its other group of patients and CT forms a real integral part. Now if you break this down according to the conditions, you know, you can see that all patients, it says that to an echo followed by a CT pulmonary angiogram or a dual energy CT pulmonary angiogram is very, very important. Same thing if you're suspecting liver disease, you're suspecting congenital heart disease, you're suspecting left heart disease, you can see everywhere CT important role is given to it. So to summarize, CT is the only test which diagnoses most conditions. Okay, once the PEH has been established or suspected, CT is the only condition which tries to put everything together in each group and may come up with the correct diagnosis. In this particular patient, when we are looking, she could have connective tissue disease she could have chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. It could be a multifactorial disease or even liver pathology. And all of this CT would be able to tell us what is going on in this patient and help in managing this patient better. So I do hope I have managed to convince all of you that uh, CT is the modality of choice and that is something that one should certainly do in patients when we are trying to establish a diagnosis or a cause of pulmonary hypertension. Thank you very much for patiently listening.